Hello everyone, welcome back. If you haven't been here before, my name is Debbie and I read a lot of books. Today I'm talking about the first book of a series that I accidentally started with book number eight. So this is The Hypnotist by Lars Kepler, which is a husband and wife team that have actually in the process of changing their pseudonym, I believe, because they are Alexander and Alexandra, so I think they just kind of stick with like Alex and then their surname, which I struggle to pronounce. So yeah, I've gone back to book number one, which was called The Hypnotist, which is part of the Juna Lina crime series. In this one, I've got books one to three, but I'm just going to cover book one in this one, and I'll see how I feel about how I want to do it going forward. So yeah, your mind is his playground, the hypnotist, which I already know about this guy because he appears in book eight. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's kind of the introduction to the hypnotist himself and how he gets involved with the police. It makes it sound very like omnius, the hypnotist, but it's just that that's his job. <laughs> and then something happens which makes him decide not to practice anymore. And so throughout the book, you'll... it essentially felt like I was reading two different books because you've got two completely different stories and then at the very end you find out how it's all connected. It was a very, very interesting one because of how it feels like you are reading two separate stories um, that are connected by this one person and then how it goes on from there. In the frigid climb of Tumba, Sweden, a gruesome triple homicide attracts the interest of Detective Inspector Juna Lina, who demands to investigate the murders. The killer is still at large, and there's only one surviving witness, the boy whose family was killed before his eyes. Whoever committed the crimes wanted this boy to die. He suffered more than 100 knife wounds and lapsed into a state of shock. Desperate for information, Lina sees only one option, hypnotism. He enlists Dr. Eric Maria Bach to mesmerise the boy, hoping to discover the killer through his eyes. It's the sort of work that Bach has sworn he would never do again, ethically dubious and physically scarring. When he breaks his promise and hypnotises the victim, a long and terrifying chain of events begins to unfurl. Like Book 8, you don't really see that much from Juna's point of view, even though it's a Juna Lina series. I think it's more the fact that he's just like the common thread through the books but you get so much from other people. In the beginning of the book is looking at the current murder investigation where you've got a boy, his entire family has been killed and this boy has somehow survived it and what happens when Eric Maria Bach is convinced to come out of retirement after saying that he was never going to hypnotise anybody ever again and he hypnotises the boy and finds out what happened. And then the other story of the book is going back to 10 years before and looking at the reason why Dr. Bark promised to never hypnotise anybody ever again. Yeah, I don't want to say too much, but I must admit, having read book eight, there was a theory I had about the family killer that I was bang on the money about. But even when you do know... It's more about a why, because the fact is, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who reads it, considering the fact that it's not put into the blurb, but you do actually find out who did it quite early on, and the whole book is about trying to track that person when they go on the run, essentially, and understanding the boy's relationship with his sister, and the older sister that wasn't living at home, who managed to get out, and trying to understand that family dynamic, and trying to understand why the person who did it, did it. But yeah, and then obviously there's the other storyline where you go back and find out why Dr. Bark decided to just stop hypnotising people. With the idea that hypnotists can plant false memories into people and then Dr. Bark they're going, well actually that's kind of impossible. There are so many theories when it comes to hypnotism, of like well, does it work, does it not? And I, I found that really fascinating reading about the hypnotism side of everything and seeing how it can be used in a medical setting and how because it was a big part of book eight to be honest the first book that I read when you see Dr. Bark using his skills to get to trauma I mean that's part of his history like he was part of like this big 
I wouldn't call it an experiment. It was part of his research trying to find out how hypnotism helps people of trauma. And the idea of the haunted house, like different people um, going back to that memory of like the cause of their problems and yeah so it was kind of fascinating on that side of things but yeah because of how it was written it did feel like I was reading two separate stories until it finally came to put back together at the end you're just like oh this is why it's been split up like this because there was a point when I was just thinking this feels really long it was 600 pages ish closer to 700 pages just the first book alone for the three books it's like almost 3,000 pages for the three books because I've got it as a bundle and so it's just all three books in one kindle book essentially and yeah I just found it really interesting and I find the couple that writes it are very dark and I quite like that <laughs> I like stuff that's got a bit of grit to it and really makes you think and through it you're as I said you're seeing the point of view of Dr Eric Maria Bark and his wife and their son stuff that I didn't really get when I was reading book eight so but obviously by book eight it's established more probably through like a running story also I don't you don't get that much about Juna, to be honest. It felt like... It, it, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a common thing throughout all the books. Obviously, at this point, I've only read book eight. But really looking into the backstories of the people, just at the heart of that story. It's like it's almost like the inspector is just a spectator of it. Because he doesn't seem to be as much at the forefront of the book for a series that's supposed to be his series. Oh. <laughs> It sounds like an interesting one to talk about, and it is. I just, I, yeah, I thought it was really clever. Um, apparently it's got 3.74 stars on Goodreads, with most of them being four stars on one of the reviews that says, but spends a lot of time, time building up elaborate red hair herring successor developments being progressively less compelling. Um, I wouldn't say less compelling at all, but it, I definitely agree with he spends a lot of time building up elaborate red herrings. Just like, just when you think you know where it's going, it twists on you. So it, I do like a good twisty turny book where just when you think you know what's going on, something else happens, you're just like, oh, I'm getting this all wrong. Like... The reason for the backstory, and then it focuses on one area, only for you to realise, oh no, 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 we, we I'm into, we, like, it's almost like a form of, of interpretation, because it's like you're reading it from the wrong angle. <laughs> it's a weird way to describe reading something with a lot of twists in it, but it does feel like you're reading it from the wrong angle, because especially because you're reading it, because the section when it goes into the 10 years previously, it goes from being in the third person to the first person and so you have that unreliable narrator in that second part because it's as if he's telling the story to somebody else of what happened that made him not want to practice his research anymore like something went wrong essentially and he was just like I feel like this is my responsibility and I don't want to do this anymore and yeah, so it's almost like you're relying on someone's false memory. Does that sound intriguing? But I remember getting to a point where it's just like, this feels like it's getting quite long to get to the point. And, it, and then when it got to the point, it was just like, that was the point. So now that I've finished it, even though at the time when I was reading it, there were certain points when I thought, this is feeling a bit long-winded. Like, why am I getting this information? And then just like, oh no, this was absolutely necessary as part of the planting of a few red herrings and taking us down that unreliable narrator route with the doctor suddenly going into the first person to recount what happened 10 years before and why it was such a big deal for him to be convinced to hypnotise this young boy that survived his whole family almost being massacred. Oh, such a good first book to really kind of get you hooked in and the fact that I know that the Doctor appears in book eight I do wonder if that's going to be a thing of these books of seeing a hypnotist working with the police and I quite like the idea of where that might be going so even though it can have elements of feeling 
a bit of a slow burn but it's only in little sections because it's from the beginning of the book about finding out about the family massacre realizing that this boy survived it and then him being hypnotized it all feels fairly quick that section and then once you find out technically who did it that all comes out fairly quickly but then it goes into the whole history of the hypnotist and so it's very much his story at first it feels like it's the story of the boy who survived this massacre and you realize no it's called the hypnotist for a reason it's about the man who was convinced to come out of retirement by a doctor and the police to say look this is our only witness and so while he is coherent let's make the most of it and see if this doctor can help him recount something that might give us an idea about what happened to his family so yeah it's called the hypnotist for a reason it's not just about the family at the beginning because it all comes back to the hypnotist it all comes back to his career his research his his own family uh, the the family of dr eric maria bach it was so clever and the way it does fool you into almost a false sense of security only to twist things on you like you're just like oh and then you think you're like on the same page and it's like oh wait no i misinterpreted that and oh no i misinterpreted that yeah it was just really clever and i'm really looking forward to the rest of it and seeing how possibly uh, the role of dr maria bach the hypnotist and juna um how that professional relationship develops as well as their independent stories yeah <laughs> i just thought it was really clever um, by the end of it even though, though at times i did think just like why am i getting this why am i getting this well this is why we sent you this because actually this is important um yeah i enjoyed it <laughs> if that doesn't make you want to read it <laughs> your mind is his playground um like the other one i feel like the tagline is a bit of a red herring but yeah it's really clever it's really clever and i like that from a good murder history but yeah so uh, thank you so much for watching my dinner is ready so i'm gonna go eat because i'm starving <laughs> but yeah so thank you so much for watching don't forget to subscribe and next time i'll have to read them and figure out if i want to do them as combined or if it makes more sense to do the independent stories of each book um but yeah i'll figure that out once i've read book two thank you i'll see you next time with another video stay safe and i'll see you next time bye